for a change? I am talking, talking, talking to you. Then get ready to explore the quantum possibilities. It's time to transform that outdated paradigm into something universal and new. Time to uncover the truth hidden beneath the veil of lies. A time to think outside the box as we link to a higher consciousness. Welcome to the Awakening. awakening, awakening. And now the hosts of Broadcast Team Alpha. Broadcast Team Alpha. Nori Love and Augie Nost. Yay! Hey, everybody. Cutting edge conversation again tonight. And we are going to be doing that with a special guest that Augie's going to tell you about in a minute. And I just want to say, on behalf of Augie and I, thank you for supporting us in the chat room and thank you for supporting us through listening. Um, and if it's in your highest good, there's a donation fun function on the website here. And we welcome them as we put the money back into the show and we keep making it go and making it better. So thank you. Um, you can reach Augie on Universal Consciousness Show, Universal Consciousness Dash Show. And I'll have him correct that if I'm saying it improperly. <laughs> and you can reach me at everythingconscious.com. So let's get into the juicy stuff. We're going to be talking about some things tonight that are of a bit of a different energy. Um, we're going to be discussing JFK. And we're also going to be discussing some current events that, you know, are very much of what's in the news and what's probably triggering many people. So I just want you to know, right, since everything is energy, even the content of our show is energy. And because it is, you can intend how you receive the content and the topics of our show. So you can intend to be entertained, somewhat illuminated. Um, if you're sensitive or if you're an empath, you might intend to be a neutral observer of the show tonight and have it so that the information and the energy tonight will not feel like anything but neutral to you. Um, so this way you, you don't have to feel the pain and it doesn't have to trigger you if you're sensitive or an empath. So I am intending for the show to be way fun. Augie, can you tell us about our guest, please? Yes, I can. And I intend for the show to be educational, to build up our knowledge of the world that we're living in and make it as we are an observer so we don't have to actually live it ourselves. Anyway, we have Robert Morningstar returning to broadcast Team Alpha. And uh, he's a tremendous researcher in all of the things that we are not supposed to know about. And he's a Tai Chi master, a lecturer, radio reporter, a sought-after guest on the radio shows and TV programs, and he's done TV documentaries, and he also is the host of the Morning Star Report and the Sounds of New York News on the Revolution Radio. And besides, he's also the publisher and the editor of UFO Digest. And he was featured in the film The Professor, Tai Chi's Journey West, because he's been a Tai Chi master for many, many years. And, um, well, I see him on the radio shows just about everywhere, and he's talking about just about anything, because there's very few people that is more studied and knowledgeable on what's behind the curtain than Robert Morningstar is. So, um, uh, also, I want to say that his writings that he has uh, created over the years is uh, lodged and archived permanently at deeppolitics.com. And I've been talking way too long. We need to hear from Robert. Welcome to the show, Robert. Welcome, Robert. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Robert, Augie left something out. What was that? So before the show began, Robert showed us his new webcam because he has a new computer. And I got to see, I got to see the ancient part of you and the Tai Chi master in your eyes tonight. Because yeah, your eyes are so <laughs> dark but vibrant blue. Amazing. Well, actually, they, change, that out. they yeah. change color. They change color with the lighting. I actually have hazel eyes. 
that uh, change color with the sky and, and the ground. But thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm, very, yeah. I'm very grateful for the eyes that you described because Aww. they have opened uh, other windows into history and mm -hmm. other regions of the universe. And it's one of the great gifts God gave me. And I use it for the good of mankind, mm -hmm. myself, survival being <laughs> the primary function. Yeah. You know. Yeah. We were so, kind of talking thanks about. Thanks very much for the compliment. Oh, you're great. welcome. You're so welcome. Yeah, we were talking also about maybe we should talk a little bit about some of the stuff that has not been talked much about when it comes to Kennedy and both his life and the end of his life in that limousine. So uh, you had done some research on that, and you found out some things that just. You don't hear on 5 o'clock news, so let's educate us on that. Right. Well, I am a student of the life of John F. Kennedy. I am a product of his time. I attached myself to John Kennedy when I was about 10 years old, when I first saw him as a senator and cong uh, candidate, potential candidate. From 58 to 59, there was that period of teasing the public, is he gonna run or is he not gonna run? And that's when I first saw him on Meet, Meet the Press and I was uh, re, uh, just impressed beyond belief. He was just so different in every regard uh, compared to any other politician, especially his uh, posture, his charisma, the way he walked. And of course, the strange way that he talked, and the Kennedy mm. accent. Which yeah. we can discuss a little bit later what the Kennedy accent really is. It's not a Massachusetts accent. But anyway, he was a charming fellow. He was a war hero. And as a 10 to 12 year old kid, enthralled with uh, the, the legend, the lore, the history of World War II, um, I began to follow him in the truest sense of the word. Anytime he was on television, I was listening. But he announcements about his uh, potential candidacy, candidacy. And then uh, I actually was listening when he did declare, and we all cheered. And uh, New York was totally for, for JFK. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was a pamphleteer, you know, that we didn't have internet and okay. social media in those days. So when a candidate ran for office, it was all, you know, uh, legwork mm -hmm. and handing out pamphlets and knocking on doors and in New York City, which is populated in my neighborhood with uh, towers 15 to 24 stories high, the way to do it was to get in the elevator, go to the top floor with a thousand pamphlets, knock on every door, and if it opened, gave it to the person or put it on the door and wow. wind your way down 24 <laughs> stories, 15 stories for a few wow. months, working out of a local shop uh, that had been rented as a, you know, Kennedy headquarters here mm -hmm. in my neighborhood and he appeared on my block a block away from where I live on uh, Halloween night uh, just before the election the Friday before the election which was either Halloween or close to Halloween he appeared on 91st Street and Broadway and kept people up all night waiting for him but it was worth the wait then he won and we the nation felt like I honestly, I tell you, we felt like we were young again, mm -hmm. youthfulness, yeah. and there were these words that Kennedy used, he kept emphasizing vim and vigor. Every time mm -hmm. he spoke, he said, we have to attack these problems with vim and vigor. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what vigor is, but very few people know what vim is. What is vim? Vim, vim is uh, a sparkling energy in willpower. Mm -hmm. Having the will, the the intention, the effervescence, you know, being eager, mm -hmm. eager in will to achieve what you're going to need vigor for. So um, anyway, that was the era. And of course, it came to that tragic end, uh, yeah. November 22nd. But I think that what um, Agi was alluding to was what led up to that. And it was a critical time in American history, the most critical time in American history, because the world almost ended during John F. Kennedy's tenure. Yeah. And I believe it might have ended if uh, Nixon had won in 1960. So they were they were scared back then, just like we're scared yes, now. Yes, you know, we're back. <laughs> as far as I'm I've been saying this for the last year, 
that the division, the vitriol, the contention in, in the nation today echoes or mirrors what I remember uh, going on in uh, 1963. Uh, mm. International tension, fear of war and Armageddon, uh, social discord, but progress throughout, as we can see, as we look back, as I look back over, over I look back over 72 years of uh, American history, you know, and um, I can see we made a tremendous progress. While we're still in strife, um, social progress has advanced, but the, the nation has been manipulated into a, a perennial uh, antagonism, you know, the division according to race, color, creed, you know, we used to all come together as Americans, but with the hyphen that was introduced in 1964 by Lyndon Johnson, it uh, initiated a divide and conquer policy in politics by dividing us along ethnic lines. For example, African American, Italian American, Jewish American, mm -hmm. uh, Spanish American, or now Hispanic. Mm -hmm. uh, that hyphenation created a factionalization of our society. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I think we are starting to overcome uh, in recent years. And uh, I hope that we can. Because yeah. these are labels, political uh, jargon that have been used to uh, sway public opinion, to persuade people in, into wrong poli follow, uh, following wrong policies. And a lot of it has to do with the total deception that uh, the nation and the world suffered after John F. Kennedy's assassination. It was on that day that the, the New World Order, mm -hmm. as it supposed itself to be in those days, took over all media and were able to initiate a new era in information technology. Prior to November 22nd, 1963, whenever a major event or uh, murder, be it murder, war, or, or uh, solving a crime, the press acted in concert with the police and sometimes um, in the, quite, quite often independently in breaking the case. But after the Kennedy assassination, when they instituted pool reporting in the Dallas Police Department, that provided the CIA and the um, their underlings uh, to filter every piece of information getting out to the public. Wow. Uh, and pr um, imprint the official stamp, you know, on, on a lot of lies. You see, a lot of lies were uh, pervade out of the Dallas Police um, Department press, press conference, uh, pool press yeah. conference. And uh, the people, we the people, were so patriotic, you know, and our idea and ideals of government and the honesty of government uh, were such that we were, we were duped. It, it was easy to use our patriotism yeah. against us. And they banked on that and they banked on it again and again and again. But I see it as the first instance of mass, trauma-based mass mind control. Mm -hmm. The CIA had mastered uh, trauma-based mind control and breaking individual minds or groups uh, to bend them to their will or their programs and, you know, to indoctrinate them. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald is, is one example, you know, right. sheep dipping people and putting them through the, the uh, routine, changing their identities, creating doubles, et cetera, et cetera. So they had mastered that. but Wait, creating me, doubles, you mean cloning? No, no, not cloning at those, oh. days, those days, no. Uh, creating uh, double dual identities. You know, for example, it is known now that if you know my work, I discovered that pr the cover-up, the principal vehicle, the getaway vehicle for the cover-up, as I call him, mm. is Officer J.D. Tippett. And that's the ultimate mystery. Why was a cop killed 40 minutes after uh, President Kennedy? And no one knew the answer till 1992-93 when I took up uh, the question and discovered that the photographs that were used uh, of the body in Bethesda, in the morgue, to convince the Warren Commission of the single bullet theory was indeed a man who had been shot once through the head. One single bullet through the head had killed that corpse in those photographs. 
But that was not President Kennedy. It was Officer J.D. Tibbet. Yeah, that's what I My heard, discovery yeah. was, it was a spiritual discovery, to be honest with you. It was guided. And the first thing that I discovered, as I mentioned before, is the doctoring of the Zapruder film. I stumbled upon splice mark upon splice mark, very unusual editing of the Zapruder film in 1992. And that was the first thing that I exposed. And so when I went to Chicago in 92 to address the Midwest Symposium on Political Assassinations, uh, to expose the Zapruder film, I I brought with me questions about Tippett because in the interim, I had been reading Jim Bishop's book, The Day Kennedy Was Shot, and it was on my desk. And my girlfriend said to me, Rob, Robert, where was Tippett shot? Now, I didn't reach for the book then. I just told her off the top of my head what I knew because I'd read it in the New York Times. It said in the New York Times that Officer Tippett had been shot in the eye and that he was horribly disfigured and that he had been buried in a sealed coffin and that not even his family had been allowed to see his body. Mm -hmm. Tippett was buried on the next day. He was also buried very quickly, Saturday. Although the history has been changed, now they try to tell you that he was interred on Monday. And they try to make it like, yeah, Os Oswald Kennedy and... Um, Oswald Kennedy and... Uh, and uh, Tippett were all buried on the same day. And uh, one, two of them are in Arlington. You know that uh, uh, Tippett and um, Tippett is buried in a cemetery called Arlington and Kennedy's buried in a cemetery called Arlington. And I haven't been to Arlington, Virginia to visit the grave because I don't believe President Kennedy's body's in there. I it's was just, waiting for that. It's as simple yeah. as that. It's as simple as that. As, well, where is he? Uh, his body initially was kept as a trophy mm. uh, because they swapped it. Uh, his head was removed from his body. Yeah. And we knew that we know that because yeah. they've got Wait, who did this? Who did this? <laughs> who did this was uh, the military industrial complex. Let me just go. You asked me who did this. This is a very good moment oh. to to bring in our special guest, District Attorney Jim Garrison of New Orleans Parish. He was asked, who killed President Kennedy? And Mr. Garrison responded, yeah. President Kennedy was killed in a coup d'etat, a government-sponsored assassination. The preparation for the assassination and the creation of a tableau to make it appear to be a meaningless incident caused by a single demented young man were accomplished by the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA, it must be understood, had long since ceased to be merely an intelligence coordinating agency and had become as well a clandestine arm of the warfare interests in the United States. The reporter then asks, what was the political objective of the people who conspired to kill the president of the United States in 1963? Mr. Garrison responded, the objective was to remove from office a man who was taking steps to end the Cold War and who would have thereby re reduced the economic and political power of the industrial warfare complex in America. The Cold War had become by far America's biggest business. The military industrial complex had become by far the most powerful force in America. On the other hand, beginning with the Bay of Pigs disaster in Cuba, John Kennedy had acquired an early and significant disenchantment with the military industrial intelligence combine. Yeah. The split grew larger by the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis when Kennedy refused to take the advice of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, with the most notable exception of General Shoup of the Marine Corps, to bomb Cuba. By the summer of 1963, President Kennedy was on a clear collision course with the military industrial complex a collision course so ineluctable that in retrospect, it is apparent that if one survived, the other would not. On September 1st, 1963, against the advice of a majority of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he caused to be signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in Moscow. He initiated the beginning of peace talks with Cuba. Then, most unforgivable of all to the proponents of maintaining peace by violence, President Kennedy began the removal of troops from Vietnam. 
between August 1st, 1963 and October 1st, 1963. He reduced the then small contingent of military advisors from 15,000 down to 14,000. He ordered Secretary of Defense McNamara to have all of the American troops out of Vietnam by 1965. This would have left no foothold in Asia and would have eliminated the best market on the horizon for military hardware. hardware. Hey, it Robert, excuse yeah, me for It would have me. eliminated as well a major source of the monstrous Pentagon CIA power in Washington. Okay. We have, we have about four minutes, three minutes to break. So I, if I was trying to That's see if okay. there was, okay, I didn't know if you were ready to finish that. So can you just say that last part again? We, we have three minutes. Oh, well, the last part is that he ordered the Secretary of Defense to remove troops from Vietnam by 1965. And this would have left no foothold in Asia and would have eliminated the mm -hmm. best market on the horizon for military hardware and would thus have eliminated as well a major source of the monstrous Pentagon CIA power in Washington. Okay. It goes on, it's long, but uh, if, as, you, as we go along, as, if you ask me a question that's related to something that Mr. Garrison mm -hmm. discovered, I, I will refer to it. We can go on. Awesome. You know, okay. Another big reason probably is that they would have ended the uh, drug trade coming out of the Far East. Mm. Well, yes, he had told the CIA that to stop because yeah. he knew, you see, his father had tried to warn Eisenhower against the influence of the Nazis that we had imported after World War II. And the two principal Nazis who had infiltrated the government very early on in the the new national security state were the Dulles brothers, Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, who became Secretary of State, were yeah. ardent Nazi supporters. They had actually, along with Prescott Bush, been uh, three bankers who were uh, charged with uh, breaking federal law in funding Hitler after the war broke out. There was a bill called Trading with the Enemies Act, which forbade all yep. American companies, yep. basically sanctions. And they broke the sanctions. They, they kept shipping um, industrial uh, products to Germany and funding Hitler, and they got caught. But Prescott Bush was so high up uh, the food chain in yeah, Washington. They covered it all up. But uh, we have now about uh, 30 seconds left to a break. So Let's go take the break, and then we'll be come after the break. We will talk uh, maybe uh, just a little more about this, and then we will new, move to something really new and present that is happening right now. This is the Broadcast Team Alpha Show, hosted by Nori Love and Augie Nost. The one show that takes your doubts of the unknown and spins them into reality. Share your thoughts by calling our hotline number at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Call now. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More cutting edge conversation and exploration of the quantum universe after this. Hello, KCOR listeners. Lorian Fenton here from The Fenton Files to tell you about UFOCon 2020 in San Francisco, February 20th through 23rd. A conference like no other, UFOCon is where experiencers are going to reveal new information and science and consciousness will collide. So get your tickets at UFOCon2020.com. That's UFOCon2020.com. Don't miss what will be the most talked about conference of the decade. Immerse yourself in an epic journey through time where ancient mysteries unfold within a story of love and betrayal, as well as a battle of good versus evil in the Emissary Book One. The reader's favorite gold medal award winner for Visionary Fiction 2019, The Action and Adventure of the Emissary, continues in the Emerald Tablet Book Two. The 2019's bronze medal award winner, The Emissary and the Emerald Tablet by Tamara Veach and Renny DeFazio are both available now on Amazon.com. Let your reading adventure begin. Greg. 
great. It's great. I think it's great. It's great. It's great. I think it's the great. all new KCOR Digital Radio Network. Make a note of it. It's great. <laughs> Looking for a radio show like no other? We need something uh, brand new. Then tune into the KCOR Digital Radio Network, Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, and get ready for The Quantum Shift. A great shift of consciousness is sweeping across the Earth. Are you ready for the dimensional shift? It is amazing, is it not? The Quantum Shift. Quantum Shift. Quantum Shift. Hosted by Dr. Sam Muggsy and Kent Dunn. Be part of the fifth dimensional reality where consciousness prevails and the universal law of one is the only true reality. The Quantum Shift. Quantum Shift. Quantum Shift. Live Tuesdays, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Whoa. The moment my son saw a redwood tree. It's huge! Is the moment I knew that for him. You can't even see the top of that thing! Even the sky has no limit. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Learn about forests near you and discover cool things to do when you go. Your moment is out there. Find it at discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Going live. Come explore the quantum possibilities. This is Broadcast Team Alpha. Broadcast Team Alpha. To be on the show live, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Share your thoughts of the show on Twitter at KCOR Radio, hashtag KCOR. Or join the Cutting Edge Conversation live in our chat room at www.kcorradio.com. Now, back to Broadcast Team Alpha with your free-thinking hosts, Nori Love and Agi Nas. Hey, and we are back. So, it just occurred to me that I haven't given a shout out to the chat room shout out to the chat room. I missed you guys because we had the holidays and it just occurred to me that I'm not signed into the chat room. So I can't call you by name, but thank you for being there. And we're going to continue talking um, a little bit more about the president Kennedy assassination, the, the things that have only been said in certain circles. And then we're going to go on to a more current assassination. So Robert, where were yes. we? Uh, we were talking about uh, geopolitical issues mm-hmm. regarding the assassination of JFK. I would be remiss if I did not mention, besides the nuclear test ban treaty that he had signed uh, to stop nuclear testing in the atmosphere. You know, that was one of the big gripes of the of the military industrial complex. They couldn't, they could no longer blow up hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere or underground or in outer space Mm -hmm. and uh, had to limit the size of testing but the the straw that broke the camel's back literally came on november 12th when president kennedy had a hotline exchange with premier khrushchev and he proposed joint ventures in outer space uh, exploration going to the moon together and most importantly exchanging information about UFOs because President Kennedy and Premier Khrushchev were afraid that the UFOs had been trying to trick us into nuclear war with each other, that they would swoop in from northern latitudes coming down over Canada at hypersonic speeds in formations that look like a missile, mass missile attack on the United States. And then would put us into DEFCON 2, DEFCON 1 defense situations, uh, postures, and they would do the same to the Russians. Then they'd stop in midair and just go vertically back into outer space, playing a game of chicken or playing a game of chicken with the two of us. So the president and the premier were worried that this was one of the strategies that the UFO entity was using, perhaps to trick trick us into... uh, you know, a, a mistaken yeah. nuclear war. 
That he issued, and on the same day, um, he, he wrote to NASA and the CIA for reclassification of all unknowns, his word, their word for UFOs, and to begin to exchange information with the Russian Academy of Sciences. That was a NASA directive to begin preparations for joint space exploration. And shortly thereafter, a memo came out, which, um, which is called the Burn Memo, and you can find it at MajesticDocuments.com. And it describes um, the reaction of the CIA, in particular, the head spook, James Jesus Angleton, uh, into silencing the president. First, stonewalling him, then deflecting him. And if he insisted, they said there had to be um, wet works. That means uh, assassination. He invoked the 5412 committee in this memo. And that is an executive action committee in the sense of execute action, executive action. So that was it. That was his uh, death warrant. And it put the nation into 50 years, 55 years of living by perpetual deception mm. until President Trump came out and started to declassify all the JFK uh, documents. Uh, uh, major, major things. I mean, mm. I've even found out that Lee Harvey Oswald, I have the telegram that Lee Harvey Oswald sent to the FBI warning them that there would be an attempt on the president's life on November 22nd. He sent that on November 20th. I'd always heard about this telegram, mysterious telegram, that they, all the FBI agencies' offices had gotten it. So this was like, um, you know, like a text code. Right. You, you know, you can see, you know, you type in that text code. He, somebody knew it and sent it to that text code, which meant it went to Washington, all the field offices. And when it was found... Uh, Hoover retrieved every single one of them from every other office, but one of them was kept, the, the one that went to Washington, and that was one of the documents that uh, President Trump released. Wow. So Oswald was actually a hero. He had infiltrated the assassination apparatus in order to expose it and perhaps try to save the life of the President of the United States. Wow. wow. In a nutshell. Well, I wish that they had released all of the documents on the assassination, uh, but the well, you know, that's it's that's what this impeachment thing is all about. They know the president is intent in his second uh, in his second term, everything's going to come out. But they're trying to stop it by hook, by crook, and by crook, mostly by crook. crook, yeah, by, by hook, crook. by crook. By crook. Is the <laughs> And, you know, it's very timely you now. We're going to have to uh, address the subject of this, uh, the assassination of this nefarious Ghassim mm -hmm. Soleimani. But it is ironic, you know, that the CIA is integral to all of these events. Mm -hmm. And these events actually started in 1954 with the deposition and the assassination of uh, Mossadegh. Mossadegh was the president of Iran at that time. And the oh. CIA conducted a coup against Mossadegh. He was a democratically elected uh, president. And they conducted a coup and eliminated him. And they established the Shah of Iran, the ancient king of Iran. They restored him. And he ruled Raza Pahlavi until 1978 when this whole thing broke. And they seized the embassy. So here's the point. Democrats in particular, the media in, in, in cahoots with them, is ignoring the fact that Iran declared war on us in 1978 and has been conducting war on us since 1978. Yeah. When they invaded the embassy, the embassy is U.S. territory. It's got a, something that's called extraterritoriality. It means it's not part of the land on which it's built. It is. It becomes the United States. So any embassy invasion is an invasion of U.S. territory. Secondly, they declared war openly. They began uh, 40 years of constant terrorist activity spanning the globe. Qasim, Qasim Soleimani was involved in the Beirut bombing in Lebanon. It killed our Marines, 256, 358 Marines during the Reagan era. He was involved in fo uh, fomenting the civil war in Yemen. 
He was involved in the rocket attacks on Riyadh last year. And Lebanon, uh, Gaza, anywhere Hezbollah is acting, that is the hand, the bloody hand of Soleimani. Mm -hmm. And not only against external enemies, he slaughtered thousands. He's murdered, tortured, and slaughtered thousands of his own people who formed the opposition to the religious tyranny that has ruled Iran since Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khomeini took yeah. over in 1978. Yeah. Khomeini brought a great evil to Iran. And even though his body dissolved, the evil is still emanating from that place because right. his theology is entrenched in the minds and hearts of the most fanatics, the Revolutionary Guard and the Al-Quds Force. So can we, can we just talk about sure. the, the fanaticism just for a minute? Because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an old nurse. There's, there's not that much that, you know, makes me go, hmm, anymore. But you know, I read an article about the funeral of Soleimani, and there was a human stampede. Yes. Right, the human beings that live there in the surrounding areas have a stampede where they sacrifice each other. Right, I don't know, fifty-three died, two hundred were hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what what are you it thinking? What are, you thinking? what are you thinking? What are you thinking when you do that? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's something. It's mind control of the highest order. I want to remind everyone that mind control started in Iran. Over a thousand years ago, the first assassins congregated, were congregated yeah. in Persia, in Iran. And a man named Hassan al-Sabeh had uh, a group of drugged religious fanatics that wow. he poured into his, his gang. He would get them all drugged up on hashish and put them in a beautiful garden with all the pleasures of the world and made them believe that they had gone to heaven. Oh, and my then God. He'd, then he'd throw them out and say, you've got to go and kill so-and-so, the mayor of this town or this businessman, and if you don't, you can't get back into paradise. And, of course, wow. drug, these drug-crazed killers would go out and do these heinous deeds and then go back. And they got their name from him, Hassan and Hashish. So Hashashishim, Hashashishim. Wow. That is the wow. word assassin. That's the origin of the word assassin. Mm -hmm. And they made it an art. These people have made assassination an art and a skill. And they spread it everywhere that, that Islam um, dominated. These techniques for keeping people under submission, which yeah. is what Islam means, uh, were conducted. Yeah. So mm -hmm. these people, I feel sorry for them because they are mind-controlled individuals. Their souls have been, their souls have been um, abducted and raped. It's quite yeah. literal. Well, you know, I really appreciate this conversation. I really appreciate that uh, that what I just learned about that, Robert, because it's giving me a different perspective. You know, I, I had no idea that that really happened there or originated there. But when I would look, you know, what they would do, um, I couldn't make sense of it. So this is really good. It gives me a, a level of compassion. For them I recommend also. that you read a book called The Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. Oh, Everyone yeah. runs away from it, but that's the book. That's one of two books. Uh, one is a manuscript and one is that book. I read them simultaneously. One was the work of the most world's foremost scholar on Shia Islam. And I read it side by side with the Satanic Verses because I wanted to know why Ayatollah Khomeini had put a $4 million bounty over time uh, on Salman Rushdie's head. What had he done? And what I found was People claimed that he had been uh, sarcastic and had ridiculed Islam. The fact was, he wasn't. He actually told the world what the Islamic fundamentalists really believe. His one insult, what I will consider an insult, for which he, they, they wanted to put him to death, was this. All of... Uh, the Quran and the New Testament all predict the coming of a Messiah. They call the Mahdi. 
right? That people, ex Christians yep. expect Jesus Christ, Jews express uh, expect the Messiah, they expect the Mahdi. But Salman Rushdie wrote up the return of the Mahdi and he made the Mahdi a woman. Oh, boy. No, brother. But in that, in that book, he tells you how Satan introduced himself into Islam and was accepted wow. along with his three satanic daughters, Uza, Alat, and Manat, as deities and um, angels in wow. Islam. That was the first heresy that infused itself at the time of Muhammad. In 935, a more sinister Luciferic heresy infused itself into Islam, and that was the heresy of Ashan Magani. He taught that he had become God, and that he had become God by uh, practicing a certain meditation, which was to always follow the opposite of the truth. Mm. And so by following the opposite of the truth, he had achieved what he called Godhead. And so he posited that the opposite of the truth was a higher cosmic principle than truth. Mm. Well, and that God creates by destruction. That God mm. creates good by doing evil. Mm -hmm. And that when they act that way, they are acting as the shadows of God. Aren't they? Well, so, it kind of, kind of makes sense, actually. If Satan is their god, then it makes perfect sense. It, it makes perfect sense if you understand that their theology is the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So yeah. the enemy of, of Christianity is Satan, Lucifer, the devil, as we call it. And yeah. so they embrace him as an ally against us. Yeah. So and all of gonna, this deception... All of this deception, massive, I mean, just layers of deception, is all satanic. I have to agree. And also, yeah. it is, um, we don't realize that there's never been peace in the Islam, even though they call it the religion of peace, it's never been at peace. It's been an ongoing 1,400-year war between Sunnis and Shiites and Sufis and Baha'is, all these different sects, mm. they are all antagonistic and it's it's a festering it's a festering wound. Mm. That's what it is yeah. of, of religious illness. And when I hear that uh, somebody say it's the religion of peace, I cringe because uh, before people should uh, judge anything, they should really find the facts. I read the biggest part of the Quran, and I tell you there is, yeah, there is love in it. There is peace in that book. For Muslims, there is none of it for us. Right. That's right. Where, where, anywhere in, in the Gospels did you read Jesus calling for somebody's hands and feet to be cut off or tongues to be cut out? Yeah, no. Where no, did no, Jesus no. ever say so-and-so should be beheaded? Yeah, no. No, I'll tell you, there is one death sentence that Jesus decreed, and people should be aware of it. He said that anyone who corrupts the children... It'd be better mm -hmm. to tie a millstone around their neck and the millstone be thrown into the sea. That's the that's the only death sentence. Well, isn't that timely right now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there'd be a lot of millstones flying. It'd be a big market for millstones if, if that were yeah. yeah. out of stones. <laughs> so anyway, I remember John F. Kennedy with great reverence and great love. Mm. He's guided my life throughout my life. He sustained mm. me in the hardest times. And uh, I believe that um, the spirit he infused in me has pulled me through near-death experiences, several, yeah, close calls. And so um, I'm grateful to have lived in the time I live, and I'm looking forward to the next 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> and you can do it's that. Gonna be a great, it's going to be a great, great century. There's a little housework to be done. And this is an essential part of it. All three great religions foretell an end time preceding the return of the Messiah. Yeah. And if that is to happen, mm -hmm. we have to get the house in order. And this is part of it. And better to do it now than seven to ten months from now when Iran will have a nuclear weapon. That's what it's all about. They never stopped developing their nuclear weapon. 
Look, I when, President, President, when President, President Trump abrogated the agreement, what did they do? Next week, one week later, they came out. Oh, okay, we've got these ten thousand high high um, high technology centrifuges that we're spinning up. And those ten thousand high technology centrifuges never spun down. You think mm. that's that's what's really happening? They live by deception. Yeah, they say. Kiss your enemy's hand until you have the chance to cut it off. <laughs> so, do you want to, we have, we have, I don't know, maybe at least five minutes left. Do you want to talk at all about the missile attack? Well, I would like to announce to the public who's listening that uh, Iran has launched uh, tens of missiles from Iran onto uh, a U.S. air base in Iraq. And, of course, if there are casualties, there will be consequences, as the president promised. I would also like to say, if we have time, that I have a, my own radio show on Revolution Radio that's at freedomslips.com. People have trouble remembering. If you remember kissing the Statue of Liberty, you'll never forget it. Freedomslips.com. And that's on Sundays at 3. And next Sunday at midnight, I will be with Richard Hoagland discussing the mysteries of Antarctica and uh, showing some remarkable photographs that I discovered last year of fountains of light coming out of the ice, mm. apparently where flying saucers have landed, mm. and also other celestial phenomena that shouldn't have been there in 1947. So that's on the other side of midnight next uh, Sunday at midnight. That Easter. sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow. And, of course, you can follow my work, uh, my political work, I guess I call it, on Facebook. And also I produce a lot of science and uh, entertainment. And uh, you can follow me on Facebook. I'm Robert dot, Robert Morningstar dot 12. I'm also on Twitter as Rob Morningstar. And uh, stay in touch. That's yeah, and you are, you're still uh, lodging your writings on deeppolitics.com, right? Well, that's where they're archived. I'm actually publishing on uh, UFO Digest. Uh -huh. That's the main, uh, the main uh, avenue for the paranormal. I also have on WordPress, I have something called the UFO Spotlight on dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Each, we put the UFO Spotlight on some important subject in each of our articles there. Yeah. And my email is robert.morningstar at gmail.com. Very mysterious. Yes. I remember. <laughs> Not transparent at all. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Robert, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for um, illuminating me. Um, and I didn't really get triggered, so yay. Um, well, I tried to be. <laughs> yeah, I think Moderate. what is what is um, next for you now, Robert? What, what, are you starting on any projects or anything that uh, we should be looking forward to? Yes, uh, I'm uh, quite quite involved in filmmaking myself i have my own uh, you know i guess my own film studio cameras editing and right now i'm working on an amazing uh documentary on orbs as uh plasma bodies mm -hmm. that are alive uh, my co-host on revolution radio mr rose sent me some he sent me the best video of orbs and poltergeist activity that I've ever seen, including one which is a ghost, I call it a ghost, that issues out of a wall with a sound that sounds like a human breath. It goes, ah, like that. Ooh. And it comes out and it changes shape. And as it changes shape, it, the shape changes commensurate with the change in frequency of the sounds that I hear. It's really, it's almost like as if he caught a picture of the banshee. Wow. The others are mm -hmm. orbs and luminosities that emanate out of certain regions, specific regions of his walls. And then they start to come into the room and move around with, I would say, intelligence. Yes. Great beauty and yeah. intelligence. They don't bump into the furniture. Right. <laughs> right. And they're not projections on the wall. You know, if right. you flash a flashlight on a wall, it hits the surface, makes a round form. And if you go up along the ceiling or at the crease between wall and ceiling, it will break. These things pass in front of solid objects in front of those things, and there's no break. And they actually f um, shine with uh, varying intensities of luminosity. It's kind of like fireflies. Mm 
Oh, it's very beautiful work. I'm very oh, impressed. That's, that and makes I my own experience. I'll we'll um, have to keep an eye on that. Yeah, we maybe have... we can do a show about that uh, yeah. at the time because it's fascinating. I think there are a lot of living things around us that we do, we cannot see, right. but the camera can see them. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So we got, we're, yeah, we, we got, have <laughs> two minutes to the show close. Yeah. <laughs> One and, one quick question for you, Robert. If you could talk to the whole world, what would you say, tell them in the next 30 seconds? I would say find yourself, be at peace, don't be afraid. Your fear will draw things that will make you more afraid. Try to pe put people around you at ease. Don't be antagonistic. Don't be hostile. Love your fellow man and love your fellow woman. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't even want Thank to do that. Thank you for asking me that question. Thank yeah. you well, for asking me the question. We'll yeah. see you. We'll see you next week, everybody. Augie, I'll see you next week. Okay, we will be here next week. Bye bye. Yeah. You've been listening to Broadcast Team Alpha. Broadcast Team Alpha, hosted by Nori Love and Augie Nost, every Tuesday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The balance of power is shifting, shifting to a new paradigm. Will you be ready? For more information on Broadcast Team Alpha as well as the hosts, Nori Love and Augie Nost, please visit their website at broadcastteamalpha.com. Until next week, remember to keep those minds open while always exploring the endless quantum possibilities. Broadcast Team Alpha, over and out. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is